<laughs> Ew, excuse me. <laughs> the World Health Organization recently released some startling findings in a new study. 35% of women from around the world have been raped or physically abused. At least 80% of the time, this violence is at the hands of a partner or spouse. Joining me today here in New York is Patrice Queen, a survivor of domestic violence. And with me from Washington, D.C., is Paulette Sullivan Moore, Vice President of Public Policy, National Network to End Domestic Violence. And Paulette, I actually want to start with you. These figures are truly eye-opening. The World Health World Health Organization analyzed data from 141 studies in 81 countries. Do you know where the U.S. stands? Are we leading the globe in fighting this problem? The United States is right up front in fighting this problem, and it needs to be. One in three women in the United States is a victim of domestic violence during the course of her lifetime. One in three to one in four. Those are high numbers. Uh, so we are doing great work. We've passed the Violence Against Women Act. The president was able to sign that into law in April. Uh, we are now working very hard to pass some reasonable gun control measures because what we know is that a third of all of the women who were killed uh, each year in this country are killed uh, by, by someone who was supposed to love them, a partner or former partner and that uh, a substantial number of two-thirds of the women who are murdered by their partner are murdered with a firearm. Uh, and so we really, that's one of the pieces of legislation that the United, issues that the United States is also leading on. Uh, Paulette, you talk about uh, the U.S. Uh, leading the world in efforts to combat this, and you also mentioned Violence Against Women Act, VAWA. And I'm curious, because in, in 94, uh, when VAWA was first created, I understand that it created the first U.S. federal legislation just acknowledging domestic violence. Then with each reauthorization in 2000, in 2005, and in 2013, there have been more things added to VAWA. Is that an indication? then that the violence is increasing or simply awareness and people are coming out of the dark shadows seeking help? I think it's a great indication of our awareness. For example, one of the things that happened with VAWA 2013 is that the tremendous violence against Native American women has been appropriately addressed in this VAWA for the first time. Um, so as we see new tragedies um, and de okay. determine new ways to address those tragedies. We increase uh, the, the, the depth of the bill and, the, and making certain that everyone gets protected by the Violence Against Women Act. We did the same thing this year in the VAWA 2013 with rights for lesbian and, and gay members of our community who are victims of domestic violence. We continue to understand that there is a need and attempt to meet that need. Paulette, I have a question for you. You'd mentioned um, that there are policy gaps that exist. I'm wondering if you could uh, go through some of where you see gaps going on in this policy and where women are falling through the cracks because of them. Oh, here's a, here's a great example. We succeeded in getting VAWA passed, but we also know that one of the protections that our federal laws provide for us is that certain persons should not have access to, to guns, to weapons, to firearms. Um, we, we know that felons should not have access, and we have a law that says that. We also know that people who commit misdemeanor acts of domestic violence should not have weapons, and our law says that. Or someone who... who um, has a protection order against them because they've been a domestic violence abuser, should not have firearms. The dilemma is that 40% of the weapons that are sold in this country are sold either through private sale or internet sale. So that's 40% of the gun purchases in the United States that don't have to go through the background check. Um, Wisconsin killing, uh, at the spa was a horrible example of what happens when that law, when that gap exists. Sure. 
And, and Patrice, I have to bring you into the conversation. You know, when we look at this, we see numbers, we mm -hmm. see stats, but the reality is this was real for you. Uh -huh. I understand that you are an advocate for survivors of domestic violence. Yes. Tell me a little bit about uh, your story and what happened to you and your children. Um, could I answer about the gap first? Sure, um, absolutely. In, in New York, in New York without gap, there's a gap between services. And right now, there's so many, much cutbacks in New York that women who are DV are being termed homeless after mm -hmm. they leave the shelter. So they don't have the protections that the, that the DV priority would um, give them because the DV priority is not there at all. And so there is a total disconnect between policies and what really happens um, with, with, with women. Um, <clears throat> at what point do they, do they have to leave the shelter or they are at some point leave the shelter, go to a proper home, and then they are no longer followed after and taken? Well, we have a problem with housing in New York, and so there's not sufficient housing. So in New York, we, we, are, we 190 days is, is the stay that they have within shelter, and then they become homeless. And 190 days is mm. not a lot of time no. uh, to try and rebuild your life. And, no. and you know this all too well. Yes. Uh, you struggled with this for quite some time. Yes. But at some point, you decided to leave. What, what finally got you there? Well, uh, leaving wasn't easy uh, because I had several um, times that I dealt with domestic violence as a, a young person and um, then in my marriage. And so leaving was not easy. However, one day, my, my husband, being a person of power and control, he asked for a divorce. And so at that point, I said, hmm, if he could leave, I could leave. Mm. And so I said, oh, wait a minute. Tell you what, two weeks, I'm gone, OK? And a week later, I was able to, to find a place. Um, I, I did try being in the shelter, but I, I also had a job, and so that was rather difficult. And so, to save money, I had to live in my car so I could um, have the money to go into an apartment. When, in New York, when, when um, victims leave their batterer, they, they are required to leave their job, mm -hmm. you know? And required to leave everything, for safety reasons. Sure. Yeah. For safety reasons. And, but because there's the, the resources are not connected to the survivor, then you get into the shelter and almost immediately you need to get a job, you need to um, find resources for the children, so on and so forth. So there's a disconnect in most shelters about getting the services that you need. Do you think that this is one of the deterrents for why women perhaps don't leave right away, leave their husbands? And, because and there's no place for them to, to really go. go. Uh, it, it's a deterrent, but when you're finally ready to leave, it doesn't matter, the Nothing's deterrent, and it doesn't matter that there's no housing. However, um, if, if you say that there is housing, then let there be housing, Sure. okay? And let, let, let them have the support, because with the resources, you're able to heal. Without the connection to the resources, it's quite difficult to, to um, do it right. You, you just kind of have to hold yourself together and just move forward, yeah. and that's not the way to do it. And Paulette, clearly we are hearing firsthand accounts of the, uh, the repercussions uh, of those policy gaps uh, when it comes to uh, how states and the nation uh, really handles this. I I'm curious, though, as to uh, what the ramifications are culturally though. This is not a, an issue that is only isolated to batterer uh, and, and, and victim. It affects all of society. Mm -hmm. So how do you start to uh, change the culture and dialogue that allows this kind of behavior to continue? And just before I answer that question, can I agree with Patrice that there mm -hmm. is absolutely a substantial gap between the needs that victims have and the services that we are able to provide. Mm -hmm. um, our office works, the National Network to End Domestic Violence works very intently attempting to get Congress to pass a budget that is sufficient to pay for housing, to pay for services, to pay for programs, mm -hmm. to address the needs of victims of domestic violence. Uh, we do a 24-hour snapshot every year, and we know that we, uh, in the one day that we did the snapshot, 
64,000 people across the United States were, received domestic violence services, but another 10,000 in that one day, 10,000 were turned away because there were not enough resources for the services. Uh, so I would agree with Patrice wholeheartedly. There are a number of shelter models um, and programs. Uh, there are some shelter programs that work pretty effectively in, in guiding uh, survivors directly into transitional housing programs. And, and I understand that, programs. Paulette, but, 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 but my question is, how do you mm -hmm. change the culture that fosters an environment? Oh. Mm -hmm. that... We have to, yeah, go ahead, I, go ahead. yeah, we have to, we have to tell, we have to continue to punish people who are domestic violence offenders. We have to continue to instill in our children at very young ages what healthy dating relationships are. Mm -hmm. We have to have a society that values the human worth of every individual so that if we teach our children and teach ourselves that every individual's life has value, every individual's self-identity has worth, that's when we will solve the problem. And that's what we have to keep working towards doing. That's why a lot of the programming involves what's called primary prevention. We're just attempting to address what's a good, healthy relationship between two human beings so that they uh, complement and, and invigorate each other's lives rather than diminish each other's lives. And, and Paulette, Patrice, uh, I, I can see you, you, you were just <laughs> waiting to, to respond. Thank you so much, Paulette. But I, I want to get uh, Patrice a moment to, to also... Uh, There's a bad today. secret about domestic violence, and sometimes the victim is not always the, the, the woman or the man. Sometimes the victim is a child. Yeah, and um, in my case, um, as a, a, a young child, I, I was a victim of sexual violence um, within um, the circle. And that behavior made it difficult to know going forward um, how to push other things out of the way. Mm -hmm. And... Um, to recognize that yeah. you... When you, when you start at such a young age mm -hmm. of being a victim of violence, it's hard mm -hmm. to recognize when you mature that right. this is this is not the way I'm supposed to be treated. And mm -hmm. then then if you have family members who are the perpetrators, mm -hmm. like my father was uh, my perpetrator, and as an adolescent, um, um, well, would prostitute me, then it was even more difficult that that when the person that I thought was a person that could help me to escape out of this dark place mm -hmm. um, became the person that also would abuse me. And then it's like, well, maybe this is the best that it can get, right. Right. you know? Right. Well, I, I have to say uh, thank you so much, Patrice, mm -hmm. for, for joining us, for, for mm -hmm. sharing your story mm -hmm. and inspiring and showing others that there is a way out. Mm -hmm. and, and thank you, Paulette Sullivan Moore. Uh, certainly hope that you are able to get continued uh, success uh, there on Capitol Hill as you continue to fight for the rights of survivors of domestic violence. Thank you, ladies, both. Thank you, Christina. And you are watching Our Take.